Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Bob and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm a member of the Happy Way Group in Englewood, Colorado, uh, and I didn't pick the name. Um, <laughs> see, I thought it'd be a lot better if I was part of a group called the Beaten Into a State of Reasonableness Group, <laughs> or at the very least, the Outright Mental Defectives. Um, but some sweet little old lady about 50 years ago <laughs> decided that that was going to be the name of our group, and we've all been joked at ever since that. <laughs> it sounds like a bunch of people on Thorazine. <laughs> uh, I want to thank John. has really done a good job. As, uh, my God, I've eaten more this weekend than I've eaten in the last two months, and uh, he's really done a good job. Um, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1968, but I couldn't get, um, I just couldn't get it. I, uh, I would go to AA meetings and people would kind of stroke me. Back then I thought that AA was just some place you turned yourself in to. <laughs> and so I knew I was a bad drunk. So I'd go turn myself in, and then... But I, the people I saw there didn't look like me. First of all, I was in my 20s and 30s when I was doing that, and all the rest of those folks were much older, and they didn't look like I looked. They didn't look rough. They didn't look like um, street people, basically. And they look like church people. And you'd walk in there and they'd go, keep coming back, honey. <laughs> and and then some of them said some things to me that I really didn't understand and that made me really angry. One of them was, why don't you just keep the plug in the jug? And I told him where I was going to put the plug. Um, <laughs> And they would say, well, don't drink and you won't get drunk. Um, see, I could strangle people that say things like that. That doesn't make any sense to a drunk. How the hell are you going to stop drinking? If you were like me, you would have lost the power of choice and drink. I started... Uh, I never even started drinking until I was 17 years old. And uh, I come from a long, long line of alcoholics. People in my family have been dying from alcoholism ever since they left Norway. So it was normal uh, to drink a lot in my family. Everyone did it. Almost everyone died from alcoholism. A lot of them died in their 30s, and I never expected to have a long life. Uh, I figured it was going to be short and violent, and that was what my life was going to look like, and I never really expected anything else. Um, my father died from alcoholism. He was a really violent drunk. He would hit you when you he, he would hit you when you would least expect it. It would just uh, I was sitting there having dinner with him one night and uh, my sister and I had a stepbrother and his wife at the time and um, and he said, "Have a piece of bread." And I said, "No, thank you." And he said, uh, no, I have a piece of bread. And I said, no, I really don't like bread. And, uh, and the next thing I knew, he had hit me and knocked me down two flights of stairs. I went ass over tea kettle right down to a landing and then right into the basement. And it was just like, whoa, where'd that come from? 
And uh, that was the kind of guy he was. He was a real, real bad alcoholic, and he would hit you when you least expected it. Um, I started drinking at 17. It was in high school. Uh, and I was vice president of the class. I was uh, head of the youth group in my church. Um, I was a very good student. I was a good athlete. Um, but something strange happened when I started drinking, and that is that I had a really huge personality change. As soon as I started drinking, I became what the book describes as seriously or dangerously antisocial. Um, by the time... Within a year of the time I started drinking, I was sentenced to four years in the Wisconsin State Penitentiary for assault with a deadly weapon. Um, the, uh, the judge was a World War I veteran that decided that, uh, that I could be of much more use to the country as long as I like to shoot people. Uh, if they put me in the military and gave me a gun there. <laughs> uh, that sort of thinking has changed significantly <laughs> ever since then. But they told me if I went four years in the military that I wouldn't have to uh, do the four years in the penitentiary. And that if I could get an honorable discharge, that they would uh, they'd kill the number. So... Um, so I went, I went in the Navy. I thought, well, where do you go where you don't get shot? And, uh, <laughs> and it was either the Navy or the Air Force. <laughs> so I joined the Navy, and the next thing I knew, um, I was uh, a forward observer. Uh, now, that, that meant that you went... If you were going to invade some place, you went over in the middle of the night and with a Marine and a radioman in a rubber raft and you set up uh, an observation post and called fire in on whoever you were invading. That's not a way to live a long and happy life. Uh, so I started drinking a lot more. I was drinking a fifth a day while I was when I could while I was in the Navy. Um, and by the time I got out, I was pretty spooky. Um, I had become kind of an intensity freak. I don't know how to describe that in any other manner. Uh, but if I didn't have a gun pointing at me, I didn't feel like I was alive. So... Uh, I started, uh, I became a bill collector in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> so when I started that, I weighed 185 pounds, and that didn't seem to impress anyone. So I went up to 240 pounds, and it lifted a lot of weights. And... Um, and then people started listening to me. Um, back then, they didn't really have any consumer protection laws. <laughs> so I used to kick in people's doors and throw them up against walls and tell them what part of their body I was going to break if they didn't have the money for me that day. And... Uh, uh, basically became a psychopath. Um, uh, I was so good at it that I was asked to be the bodyguard for the manager of one of the racetracks in Chicago that was run by organized crime. Uh, and I asked, uh, the guy that told me about that, that brought the job offer to me, was my best friend in high school, who was also in Chicago. But he had taken a much better route. He was one of the biggest pimps on Michigan Avenue. <laughs> um, and he said, uh, they want you to come over here. It pays real well. And all you have to do is walk around with the guy that runs the racetrack. 
And I said, why would they ask me to do something like that? And he said, don't you know? And I said, no. And he said, you're nuts. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. And he goes, yeah, you are. You, uh, you have the perfect qualifications to do what they're going to expect you to do. Um, I didn't. I, I don't want to talk about about all that stuff. I I, uh, I was really good at what I did. I was crazy as a bed bug, and um, and I had no qualms at all about beating people senseless. Just nothing at all. And, I mean, I didn't lose any sleep about it. I didn't have any social problems with it. I, I just did it. I thought that was what I was supposed to do. Uh, at the same time, I was president of the JCs. Uh, I was president of the Optimist Club. <laughs> And I started a, uh, a big social uh, event in the city I was living in at the time. And it, people really could not figure out what the hell I was. Um, finally, one of the biggest paper mills in Wisconsin asked me if I would go to work for them. And, uh, and I did. And my background, I had uh, also gone to the University of Wisconsin and uh, uh, majored in chemical engineering. So do you see the disconnect here? <laughs> huh? Well, look around you. All right, we're all full of those kinds of disconnects. And anyone who thinks that all alcoholics are a bunch of babbling idiots has their head stuck up their backside. You know, we are bright, intelligent, uh, uh, productive people when we're not drinking and we're just the opposite of that when we are so um, I went to work for this paper company and within a couple of years I was marketing director um, I found out that I was really good at business and uh and so what they decided to do was to have me go take all their customers out. And I, I would go to Chicago, and I would go to uh, uh, New York and Wilmington, Delaware, because we had a big account there, and Los Angeles. And all I did was run around and take people out to dinner. And it was the perfect job for me. I mean, because I never stopped drinking. And finally, I went to the CEO of the company, and I said, um, I'm, I'm dying from this, and I, I just can't do it anymore. I've got to find a way to stop drinking. And he said, Bob, we don't want, we don't want you to die from drinking. We just want you to take our customers out because they all like you. Uh, and so I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, um, but I just, you know, I just didn't get it. I mean, I'm not sure anybody was telling me the solution. I don't know what the hell was going on. I know they would tell me those kinds of things that made me angry, but... Nobody was coming up and say, saying, I can show you precisely how to recover. Uh, so anyway, they um, I was living in this city in Wisconsin. It was called Fond du Lac. And, uh, and finally my wife left me. And we had two sons, and she took both of them and went to France. Um, and... Um, I went on this 
you know what Bill Wilson calls a prodigious bender. Um, I just, uh, I was drunk for like three or four days and don't remember any of it. And wound up on the floor of an empty house. Now, now I'm going to talk about recovery. Um, I was laying, I'd been in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for about five years. And I'm laying on the floor of this house, wondering where the hell I was and whether I was hallucinating or not. And these two guys came through the front door. And uh, and I'm looking at them going, is this real? Uh, And the one guy looked like the guy who had offered to be my sponsor at an AA meeting. (laughs) And he had a new guy with him. And I'm laying on the floor trying to figure out if it's hallucinations or not. And this new guy started dancing around me. And he's going, oh, my God, oh, my God, what are we going to do with him? Jesus, does he look sick? Are we going to take him to the hospital? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think he'll go into DTs right in front of us or convulsions? What do you think we ought to do with him? You think we ought to take him to the halfway house or take him to the hospital? Or what the hell do you think we ought to do with him? See, if I would have had a gun, I would have shot this son of a bitch. He was appropriately named Dick. Uh, so they they decided that they would take me to this alcoholic's halfway house. So they took me over there and sat me down in front of this guy that ran it was a Catholic priest. I mean, and like the collar and everything. And he said, are you an alcoholic? And I said, yeah, I am. And uh, he said, uh, are you done? And I said, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, if I'm not done, it's probably going to kill me. By that time, uh, my liver was the size of a football, and it was sticking out of my side. It was already starting to turn yellow. Um, and he said, uh, do you want what we have? I don't know what the hell they had. <laughs> but I figured it was better than what I had. And uh, I said, yeah, I do. And uh, he said, do you believe in God? And I said, I, and say, you need to understand I was brought up a German Lutheran. All right? And Catholics were not way up on our hit parade. <laughs> And so when he said, do you believe in God? I said, no, just to piss him off. (laughs) And he looked me right in the eye and he said, then you're shit out of luck. (laughs) Which I thought was inappropriate for a priest to say. (laughs) And I said, why is that? And he said, can you stop drinking? And I said, no, I can't. And he said, well, I got some bad news for you. Uh, We can't stop you either. There aren't enough people in this whole city to stop you from drinking if you want to take another drink. And then I was wondering why they brought me over there. I mean, what's the point then? (laughs) And... uh, And he said, the only thing that will save you is turning to God. And I said, I I wouldn't even know how to do that. And he said, what do you know about God? And I said, now I lay me down to sleep. (laughs) And uh, he said, well, we're going to take you home, and I would spend some time in prayer. And... uh, 
and then we're going to come and pick you up and bring you over here to a meeting. Um, and that's what's going to happen, but I, I would certainly give some thought to prayer. And then they took me home. All right? Now, I knew what was going to happen. I'd been in DTs before. And frankly, at that point in time, I thought that I had gone so far over the edge that it, I was dead anyway. I just, I really did not expect to survive. And so when I went into DTs or, and or convulsions, if it just killed me, that was fine. I was done. I, I, I really did, couldn't live that way any longer. Didn't want to live that way any longer. I had made a total mess out of my life. I was generally hated by everyone because I was, you know, I didn't really have any close friends because they were afraid to be around me. Um, so I just sat there and waited for the inevitable, and here it came. And the next thing, I was rolling around on the floor, and I was seeing things coming out of the walls. And I went into the kitchen for something, maybe to get a drink or something, uh, water. And I saw ants the size of this podium coming out from underneath my refrigerator. And I ran over there and picked up, bear hugged the refrigerator and picked it up and carried it halfway across the kitchen to see where those ants were coming from. And then I ran into the cellar way and got, there were three cans of Raid there. And I emptied them all in this little tiny kitchen and goddamn near asphyxiated myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember much after that. Um, <laughs> couple days these guys came back and they said we're taking you back to the halfway house so I went over there and I saw the priest again and he said did you pray and I said yep I sure did and uh, he said what do you think about God and I said well I'll tell you what if there's a God, I would like him to be like some kind of gentle father because mine wasn't. And I would like for him to give a damn about whether I lived or died or what my life looked like. And he said, well, I think God's exactly what you just described. Well, within maybe a week of that time, you need to know I had to sit on my hands because they were shaking so bad, and I would sweat so much. God, I don't know. You don't hear people talking about that too much, but I, w I would change colors in a shirt. I mean, I'd be wet clear of my waist by the end of a meeting. And I went into this meeting, and the topic, it was a men's meeting. And the topic of the meeting was how much fun they were having with their significant other. <laughs> it wasn't a sex inventory meeting. <laughs> and I had to sit there for an hour listening to these guys talk about how much fun they were having in, in, in their intimate relations with their ladies. And I was impotent. Jesus, I might as well have been a brick. It just, you know, nothing worked. And, and after this meeting, I went over to the priest and I said, Father Upson, I need to talk to you about a meeting I just went to. And he said, okay. And I said, they were all talking about their significant others and about being intimate with them and how much fun they were having and all the rest of this. And I'm impotent. Maybe I don't belong here. 
And he said, no, you belong here. And I said, well, what the hell's going on with all of that? And he said, oh, that's easy. Half of them are lying. <laughs> that's the first time I found out that you could lie in an AA meeting. <laughs> So uh, he kept asking me, what do you think about God? What do you think about God? And I go, I try not to think about God. And he's going, well, let's go fishing. We go out on Lake Winnebago and we'd fish. And and he talked to me about all kinds of stuff. But every once in a while, he'd just throw one of these God things in there. And he'd go, are you still praying? Yeah. And see, my sponsor did that old thing about pray in the morning, asking God to keep you sober, and then pray at night and tell God, thank you. And I was doing that, and I didn't know much other than that. Now, I stayed sober, I guess. I mean, I didn't drink for a year. Going to meetings in this halfway house, and trying to work with others. Do you know how we 12-step people? Because we didn't know any better. So somebody go get drunk, and they go up to Oshkosh or someplace, and they get in a bar, and they'd get all hammered and everything and get sloppy, and then they'd call us and say, you got to go get Jim. So we had this, like, flying squad. <laughs> where we would take eight or ten guys and we would walk into a bar, pick the guy right up off the bar stool and walk out the door with him. <laughs> and then we would take him to this little room in the back of the halfway house and we'd babysit him until he stopped trying to escape. <laughs> That's federal crime. <laughs> well, hell, we didn't know any better. So after a year, uh, I the paper company fired me. I could not believe it. I made more money for that paper company than anyone else had worked for, and they had like 7,000 employees. And I made millions for that company. I developed products, did all sorts of things, and they fired me. Now, the reason why they fired me, I was about nine or ten months sober, still crazier than a loon, and I walked into the manufacturing plant. We had a big container plant. Walked into the manufacturing plant, and the sales service manager said, Good morning, Mr. Olson. And I reached across his desk and grabbed him by the jacket and yanked him over the desk and asked him what the hell he meant by that. <laughs> And as the senior vice president of the corporation explained to me, uh, they could not afford to have the liability of having a person like me in their company. <laughs> uh, but that, well, they thought that was a huge insurance risk if I went off on somebody over there. So. So that was it. And then so I went to a division of Kraft Foods that was already a customer of mine and um, asked them. I told them I was leaving the paper company, and they said, oh, go to work for us. They gave me a 60% raise. They offered me one of the best areas that they had in the country and said, if you'll just go to work for us, We'll give you this money. We'll send you out there for two weeks at our expense. And then you can come back and tell us if you want to go to work for us. And I did that. Uh, and I went to work for him. And within three years, I was the top producer in that company. Now, one a part of that was me moving to Denver. 
And when I moved to Denver, I, I, as soon as I got there, I was staying in this big Holiday Inn, and I, I got opened up the phone book and started looking for Alcoholics Anonymous. And there was this place called York Street in Denver, that's kind of the mother house there. And so I, I went down there. Uh, I shouldn't even tell you about this stuff. <laughs> I went down there in a suit. And uh, and this guy, I walked in the front door, and this guy looked at me, and he said, you must be one of those silk suit high-bottom drunks. And then when he was picking himself off the floor, <laughs> he changed his mind, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I went to a Sunday night young people's meeting. The young people there were like 30s, and I was in my 30s at the time, and it shows you how long ago that was. Um, and I went to Sunday night young people's meeting, and there was a guy named Don P. Some of you know him. And he was up there talking about the big book. And he said that the big book was a textbook. And that at the beginning of the textbook, in the forward to the first edition, it says to show others precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And he said, you know, he's talking about you not only don't ever have to drink again, you don't ever have to want to drink again. And that's a concept that just doesn't sit easily with me because my whole adult life had been wrapped around a bottle of booze. So uh, afterwards, after the meeting, I went up to him and I said, look, I just moved out here. I'm a little over a year sober. And uh, and I'm going to drink again, and I can't survive another trip through this deal. I just can't. Uh, I need some help. And I've never heard what you were talking about, which isn't to say that it wasn't said, but I've never heard it. And he said, will you sit across from me at my kitchen table once a week? and go through this book. And I said, yeah. And he said, have you got 30 minutes? And I said, yep. And he said, I'm going to explain to you everything I am going to ask you to do, all 12 steps. You will know everything before we start that will be required of you to get through the recovery process. And I said, okay. And so he sat down and he explained all 12 steps to me, and he did it in 30 minutes. It's no big deal. You can do it easily. And away we went. Now, I don't have a big problem with understanding I'm an alcoholic. I had a first step before I ever got here. Uh, you know, I knew that I was alcoholic. I knew that my life was unmanageable, you know. So you'd have to have a, well, I had a really firm grip on the obvious. The uh, <laughs> so, so the first part of the book went where it describes alcohol and alcoholics, I fit perfectly. Um, right about that time was in 1975. An international AA convention came to Denver. Now, you know, they have 80,000 people or what at these conventions now, international conventions. But back then, we had 17,000 drunks in the McNichols Center in downtown Denver. It was just more fun than you can imagine. And uh, all of us in the young peoples were on the hospitality committee. And anyway, we were sitting there. Lois Wilson gave a talk there. Everyone was in tears and... Uh, and then the main speaker on Saturday night was a guy named Mac Cheater. He was from Winnipeg in Canada. And uh, he got up and talked about a group called the Golden Slippers. 
the Golden Slippers were a group of people that couldn't stay sober, and that they decided to take a whole different approach towards Alcoholics Anonymous. And the approach was that instead of rationalizing about the steps or intellectualizing about the steps, they were going to take a whole new and different approach. They were going to do the steps. <laughs> so they started at the forward to the first edition, and every time it said to do something, they did it. So if it said write, they wrote. If it says make a decision, they made a decision. If it said make amends, they went out and made amends. Every time there was a direction in the middle of it, they all followed it. And as a consequence of that, virtually all of them stayed sober. Well, we're sitting there listening to this stuff going, what do you think of that? <laughs> and uh, there were 14 of us that decided that we were going to get together in this guy's basement and do exactly what the Golden Slippers had done. So we did. Uh, the guy, the guy whose house we met in, his name is Jay Levy, and he's passed on now, but he died sober. And 14 of us got together in the basement and did it. Well, about three weeks into this, one of the guys decided that he really didn't want to be sober. His name was Eddie Durkin. And Eddie Durkin went down on Larimer Street in Denver, which is the skid row, and really got his nose full and wandered off down Larimer Street and crawled into a doorway and fell asleep. Well, normally that isn't going to pose a problem, but this was January. And Eddie Durkin died right in the doorway. Um, out of the 13 of us, that were in that group, besides Eddie, eight of a, eight of them have died. All eight of them died sober. There are five still alive, and I'm the youngest. Well, I'm the youngest in sobriety. The longest one is 53 years. And my sponsor for 32 years was Don Pritz who a whole bunch of you have crossed paths with. And his sponsor, Gary B., who now runs the uh, central office in Indianapolis, had lived in Denver at the time. He's six months younger than I am in age, and he's 46 years sober. So... So why am I over here talking to you when I could be home mowing my lawn? Uh, this Because I want you to know that this thing really works. This is the first time I've ever been in a meeting where I had the longest sobriety. You know, I've been sober for a long time, but there's always a couple around that, you know. I could tell you, this thing truly works. <laughs> The, the challenge is that you have to do something about it. You know, the book says we have to fully concede to our innermost selves that we're alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we're like other people, or presently maybe, which means or ever will be, has to be smashed. We're not like other people. I'm not. I mean, I, I spent the first part of my adult life as a thug. A drunk one, which made me even more dangerous, although I was more dangerous when I was sober than when I was drunk, because I was so frustrated when I didn't have a drink. Uh, the book says, are you even willing to believe? Upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built if you're even willing to believe. I don't care where you've been, what you did, what you believed in the past, what kind of crimes you committed, how many times you've been in a prison, how many times you avoided prison, how many things you got away with, how bad you were. I don't care about any of that. If you're an alcoholic, you can recover. You are never so far down the line that you can't come back. 
The book talks about two different people. He talks about people who have what it calls the bedevilments. Can't be of real help to other people, prey to misery and depression. Uh, there's a whole laundry list of bad things that can happen to you, and the book calls them bedevilments. And then it talks about a different kind of person. It talks about a person with power, peace, happiness, and a sense of direction. And it says the only difference between those two groups of people are that this, these ones over here with power, peace, happiness, and a sense of direction have God as the central fact in their lives. See, today, I, the way I tell if my ego's outrun my second step is the book starts talking about, um, about going off the track by pomp, by something else I don't remember at the moment, or by the worship of other things. And it's almost always the worship of other things. So instead of worshiping God, there are times when I will start worshiping something else. Here's what the big three are. Money, sex, and power. It's easy to worship them. But see, when I start worshiping them, then all these bedevilments start popping up. And then my life is no fun at all. About the time we got to the third step, um, <coughs> We also, our group, as are the 14 of us, 13 of us, then we're, we're all going to do the third step together. So we were going to get on our knees and, and hold hands and say the third step prayer. And, uh, and my sponsor showed me the third step prayer and said, what does that mean to you? And I had to go through this whole thing, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me. And so, well, now... If that's the deal, that means God can do anything with me that he wants and that I will agree to it. But I don't know what he wants. I, I, you know, I've been listening to what you've been saying and here for the last couple of days, and there have been a lot of comments about how hard it is to trust God. Well, in Denver... There's this old saying, uh, the hardest thing about trusting God is trusting God. Now, how do you learn to trust God? You learn to trust God when you finally get to one of these positions in your life where you have exhausted every single resource that you have. And then there's nowhere else to turn. But generally, I don't meet people who will turn easily. So they have to be flat up against it and go, God, if you're not here now, game's over. Good way to learn to trust God. And you, uh, the book talks about certain trials and low spots ahead. It doesn't say, okay, now we got a free ride for the rest of our lives. It says that we are going to be faced with impediments during our life and that it is a perfectly natural occasion. But that if we have a spiritual basis for our lives, that we can go through those trials and low spots. Well... I can tell you from having been sober this long and having both parents die and having uh, losing jobs and having to close companies and doing all the rest of that, that there are those things and that they just scare the hell out of you, but you can survive it all 
and come back with more than what you had. You know, I thought, Jesus, by the time I'm 65, I'm going to be living under a bridge. Um, I'm 73. And uh, I don't know what under a bridge looks like. Um, I own a very successful company. I have five kids and two grandkids that absolutely love me and two ex-wives that don't. Uh, Oh, well. (laughs) You know, I'm 73. It's losing... It's losing its interest here, you know. I just, um, so anyway, my, my sponsor said, I, read this prayer. Um, Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. The bondage of self really is that I can't even see you because I'm so busy looking at me. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy love, thy power, thy way of life. May I do thy will always. You'll notice there's no amen on the end of it. It's on the end of the seven-step prayer. And the only thing that that third-step prayer prepares us for is inventory because it gives us the courage to step forward and write a clear inventory. Um, I, I uh, didn't want to do it. I w- went to this thing, and Don said, are you going to say the prayer with me? And I said, well, I don't want to. And he said, then I can't help you. And I said, you don't understand. I, didn't wa- I don't want to, but I will, because I don't want to drink again. So we all got on our knees, and then he got up and laughed about it. <laughs> and I said, what the hell's so funny? And he said, why didn't you want to do it? And I said, I didn't want to give God that kind of power in my life. And he said, Bob, God's got all the power anyway. What you think about it, it's irrelevant. <laughs> um, this is just an exercise in who's God and who's the drunk. So I I dreamed up all these bad things God was going to do to me if I agreed to that, and none of them have ever happened, ever. It's been a long time. Uh, He showed me how to write inventory, put people, institutions, and principles in the first column. Uh, second column's cause, or if you're in the resentment inventory. And then in the third column is, did it affect your self-esteem, your security, your ambitions, your personal relations, or your sex relations? So, and then there's a fourth column there that says, where were we selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? So I uh, was traveling a lot back then, and I took my... Uh, legal pad with me and I wrote down this whole grudge list of people pretty extensive and then I came back and I said now what and he said right why you're angry with them so I did that and he said but don't put in more than six words or you're overstating your case did you ever see people with these big, long, extensive second columns. They're trying to convince you that they were really mistreated. (laughs) Don't even spend your time there. And in the third column, you know, where it says, did it affect your self-esteem, security, ambitions, and all that stuff? Yeah, you know, a lot of that did. So um, I got through... With that, and I came back and I said, I'm done. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, what did I I forget? And he said, yeah, now you have to write a fear inventory. And I said, "Uh, we can just pass on that. 
<laughs> and he said, why is that? And I said, you know my history. I was a bill collector in Chicago. I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> and he said, really? Then the book must be wrong. <laughs> and I said, why do you say that? And he said, well, the book says that, he, that fear is an evil and corroding thread and that the fabric of our existence is shot through with it. And he says, apparently yours isn't. And I said, apparently. <laughs> so he said, will you humor me? And I said, yeah, I would, being the kind guy that I am. <laughs> and he said, what about snakes? And I said, what kind of snakes? <laughs> And he said, how about rattlesnakes? And I said, well, you'd have to be a fool to want to be in a closet with one of them. And he said, I think you're right. Uh, write down rattlesnakes. And I said, all right. And he said, how about spiders? And I said, like black widows? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, well, why the hell would you want to get bit by one of those? <laughs> And he said, couldn't tell you, write down spiders. <laughs> and he said, uh, how about failure? Oh, cheap shot. <laughs> and I said, you know, from the time I was 10 years old, adults have been telling me that I was going to die in a ditch like my dad did or I would die or I would wind up in a mental institution like my mother. And he said, well, write down failure. How about inadequacy? Well, I never thought I was as good as other people. So he said, all right, write down inadequacy. How about women? Well, uh, um, he said, just write down the window. <laughs> How about infants? And I said, just the little ones that they got all wrapped up. Because I'm always afraid I'm going to drop them. And he said, write down infants. How about the police? And I said, like when you got a squad car behind you? And he said, yeah. And I said, that's an interesting question. You've been in and out of three penitentiaries. What happens when a squad car gets behind you? And he said, absolutely nothing. And I said, how could that happen? And he said, I don't do anything to piss them off. <laughs> <laughs> Write down police. How about the courts? Well, you know, they sentenced me to prison. Yeah. He said, uh, is there anything you're not afraid of? And I said, I guess not. You know, when I was running around beating the hell out of people that I would wake up in the morning and I couldn't even get out of the fetal position. Back then, the doctors would still make house calls, and then my wife called the doctor, and the doctor came over there, and I'm all knotted up and can't get out of bed. And he... Uh, talked to her for a little while, and then he said, look, if this happens again, take some really strong tea and put about three shots of whiskey in it, and he'll unbend. And he was right. Works like a charm. The problem was everybody's got to get out of the house. Um... So I wrote a fear inventory, and then uh, there was uh, a sex inventory. And I, when I saw that, I thought, well, here, um, now I'll really shine. Um, and there's some interesting questions in there, and that is, is it selfish or not? Um, did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? There's a number of questions in the sex inventory. You just answer them. Um, 
I found out that I use jealousy, suspicion, and I didn't find it out. It just the lights went on when I was like seven years sober. And all of a sudden, I understood that I had used jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness as tools to keep women off balance. And it was all based on the belief that I had that if a woman ever got a good look at me, that she'd be out of there faster than I could spit. So I would use jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness to keep them off balance. I'd always keep them in the dark. And I found out that you can't have a good marriage or even a good relationship that way that a good relationship has good communication and that beating up people just to keep them off balance is not a good way to continue in a relationship. Um, let me tell you one other thing. As long as you continue to attempt to have a spiritual experience, you will continue to have them. It's when you think that you've gone far enough. It's when you want to rest on your laurels. It's when you want to stop doing all the things that keep us sober. That's when you stop having spiritual experiences. Now, when I was 28 years sober... I'm doing my 11th step, doing my evening review, and I'm asking God why I still believe some things about myself that make no sense at all. And I said, God, I want to know why after all these years and after going through the steps once a year, because the book says, that a business that takes no regular inventory is sure to fail. So I go through all 12 steps every year, and I, I don't have any scars from it. I mean, if you think I got beat up in the process, you're wrong. What I have been able to do is grow an understanding and effectiveness by continuing to go through this introspective process that we call the 12 steps. But I want to know why I still believe, among other things, that if you, if people knew me, really knew me, they wouldn't like me. How come I still think I'm a fraud? How come I think I'm dumb lucky? I mean, I have an IQ in the Mensa range. And people would, you know, when you're that big and some adult comes up and says, you're really stupid. And they tell you that because they're angry. That's nice, but it never goes away. So once they plant that seed, you're screwed for life, unless you're willing to do something about it. So I'm asking God, my 11th step, how come I believe all this stuff yet? How come I believe I'm not good enough? Now, I've heard voices twice in my life, right? First time I was coming home from Tampa and giving a talk down there, and, uh, and all I heard was, you're done. And I quit speaking at conventions for about two, three years, and I, I wanted to save a marriage, and I wanted to coach Little League soccer. And I, I coached Little League soccer, and we won the championship, and I got divorced. <laughs> Um, this time I'm sitting there going, why do I believe this? And I, all I heard was one word, and the word was principles. And I'm going, oh, wait a minute. The book talks about inventorying people, institutions, and principles, but I tried to do that a whole bunch of times, and I'd come up with honesty, open-mindedness, willingness, and those kinds of principles, but I could never get my arms around it. And so I hear this voice that says principles, and I said, well, what, what do principles have to do with it? And what I heard was 
you have a whole bunch of self-defeating beliefs that you have turned into the principles in your life. And you have just described several of them to me. And they are so deeply buried in your personality that they have become sacrosanct. You won't even challenge them anymore. And so I said, what am I supposed to do about it? And what I heard was write inventory. So I said, where do I put the belief that I've turned into a principal? And they said, put it in the first, first column. So I wrote in the first column of that inventory, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. And then I said, what now? And honest to God, I heard, open your book. And I looked at the heading over the second column in the inventory, and it says the cause. So what was the cause of that? The cause of that was being told as a kid that I was worthless and that I just wasn't worth knowing. And so then I went over to the third column, and I looked at this question. Does that affect your self-esteem? Oh, my God. It destroyed it. Does it affect your security? Yeah, how am I ever going to be scared in anything if I don't have any friends? Does it affect your ambitions? <laughs> Come on. My ambitions to be successful and be, you know, in a loving relationship and have the respect and the love of my children and... Uh, None of that can happen if that's the truth. Does it affect your personal relations? Yeah, you won't have any. Does it affect your sex relations? Yeah, sex relations are just personal relations on steroids. <laughs> so... Where was where was I selfish? I was selfish because I had believed it for so long that I wouldn't even challenge it. Where was I dishonest? Well, that's easy. It's dishonest to believe a lie. See, you need to understand, I'm surrounded by a host of friends. And I've been a loner all my life. Honest to God, they make me nervous. I just, you know, I, I really like solitude. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm just antisocial. I was told that for years. Um, but the truth about that is that I have a host of friends. I mean, more, just more than I would know what to do with, frankly. So where I'm selfish because I don't even want to challenge it, I'm dishonest, where am I self-seeking? I'm self-seeking because if that's the truth, I get to be a victim. Well, after all, you know what two of the greatest lies in the world are? Well, that's the way it is. No, it's not. <laughs> or, well, but that's the way I am. Do you know I got divorced from my second wife because of that? Because I said, why do you insist on continuing this kind of behavior? And she said, but that's the way I am. And that answer says this, that may be the way I am, but I will never change because I don't have to. Okay, but then I get to make a decision. And the decision is, I'm not living with you anymore. Uh, do you know that we have an immense number of choices in life. 
And if you don't make them because you're afraid to make them, somebody else will make them for you. You really need to make choices even if they're scary. Because at least you get to make the choice. Why is it frightening? Because I thought it was true. So I wrote down, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. I wrote down, uh, I'm a fraud. Uh, I'm, I'm dumb lucky was another one, which means I had a CPA that worked for me. And he said, God, Olson, I just don't understand you. And I said, why is that? And he said, you are one of the dullest knives in the drawer. And you just go out and create these really successful businesses. I don't know. That just doesn't connect. And I said, well, when you pick up your final paycheck later today, (laughs) you can give that some thought. I wrote down any woman who would be interested in in having a a permanent relationship with me uh, has to be crazy. You know what? All those things are lies. Every one of those things is lies. And everything that looks like that is a lie. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is that we we develop these self-defeating beliefs, turn them into principles, and then spend the rest of our life believing in them. And i got to tell you, that makes you miserable. It makes you angry. It makes you feel like you're picked on. And until you're willing to take a look and find out they're all outrageous lies, you will never escape the effects of them. Well, how did I get to that? I've been writing inventory once a year for 38 years. You know, if you still keep asking questions, you're going to keep getting answers. And when the book talks about growing and understanding and effectiveness, it isn't kidding. Well, so I went home and I did six and seven and... um, Let me just say something about that. Six is where we become willing to have to let go of all those things that we believe are character defects. And then in seven, we say this prayer asking God, I am now ready that you have all of me good and bad. That's an odd statement. You you would think that you just ask God to take the bad stuff. I now ask that you remove every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. You know what that says? That says you get to choose. I don't. So when I go into the sixth and seventh step looking at all these things that I found in the inventory in the fifth step, I don't know what God's going to remove. I can tell you this. I have always been a little aggressive. (laughs) And I always thought that being a little confrontive and that sort of thing was a real character defect. And when I got to the seventh step, I I said, after that prayer, anything you got in mind. Now, there's two places in the steps where I am willing to put everything on the altar. Everything. Everything, including my own life. And that's the third step prayer and the seventh step prayer. And I am willing to have God kill me right on the spot if that's what his will is. I'm up for it. 
So I asked him, as part of that, to remove that kind of attitude. Now, you may be surprised to hear that I today own a company that provides psychiatric care and therapy for the Colorado Department of Corrections. That's God's little sense of humor. (laughs) I regularly get locked in rooms full of inmates. They know my history. They call me OG. (laughs) So I see there are some of you who have been where I was. (laughs) OG means original gangster in prison parlance. So, you know, if somebody wants to get up and create a problem for me, some other inmate will get up and say, hey, sit down, he's OG. (laughs) Which means I was sentenced to prison before most of those guys were born. (laughs) So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this to tell you that you that you can live a life that is beyond your wildest imaginings. That unless you're totally different from everyone else that I have met in Alcoholics Anonymous, you, like me, came in here with a head full of nonsense about who and what you are. And as long as you persist in believing that bullshit, you are not going to have a good life. But all you have to do (coughs) is just go take a look. And do you have the courage to change your whole life? The 12 steps are enough. You can do it in the 12 steps if you do it over and over again. See, the question really is, how do you want to think? How do you want to live your life? How do you want to feel about yourself? Do you have the courage of your convictions? Do you at least respect yourself enough to go do these things? These 12 steps. Just follow the direction. This thing is written at a sixth grade level. (coughs) Now, I didn't understand it. (laughs) But the guy that was with me that was in and out of three penitentiaries did. Because some guy had sat down with him and showed him the same thing. So... um, What do you stand for? Do you have principles? What the hell are they? What if you see someone in an AA meeting and they're dying from alcoholism and nobody will talk to them because they're either afraid to approach them or they're afraid they're going to look bad? Are you willing to step up? Are you willing to walk over there and say, I can show you how to recover from this seemingly hopeless state of mind and body that you're experiencing? And I can show you exactly what to do, because I did it. How many times have you ever heard anybody say that? There's a woman that came into this group where I go trolling for pigeons. (laughs) <laughs> well, what's Ponzi's? Is that better? <laughs> so, and she came in, or I've been watching her come in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for about three or four years. Couldn't stay sober for sour apples. She comes in there, and she's all bent over, and she's weeping. <laughs> and half the women in the meeting got over there and started petting her. 
<laughs> and uh, it was a discussion meeting, and when it got around to me, I said, hey, I'd like to say something to that lady back there that's got her head stuck up her ass. <laughs> and her head popped up like a jack-in-the-box. And I thought, oh, God, I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> But see, my in intuition told me to say that. And, and the intuition is one of the most fantastic things you can find in this program. It talks about it becoming a working part of the mind, that we come to trust it. And see, my intuition was screaming at me to say something really rude to this person. But I knew that if I said it, that I would polarize the meeting in that everybody else in that meeting was going to think I was the biggest a-hole in the place. And they did. Uh, and see this lady. I mean, then I didn't, I didn't even get a chance to talk to her, and I left. And about a year later, I was in a meeting, and uh, here she comes. And I, she said, I want to talk to you. And I thought, oh, God. <laughs> and she said, Bob, you were the only thing I heard in that whole meeting. And that day, I put myself in a treatment center, and I've been sober ever since. And I want to thank you for what you said. Okay? Spiritual life is an interesting thing. Because you're dealing with things that just never made sense to you before. Intuitive thought is one of them. In how, you know, if I, before I got up here to speak tonight, I said over and over, God, please make me an instrument of thy will. Let me help the alcoholic who still suffers. Have me say what you would like me to say. Because I don't know what the hell to say. I mean, what do I say? I'm an old thug that drank a lot. No, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Look, this is an adventure that I suspect you truly don't want to miss. And you can experience things in sobriety if you're willing to go take a look at all the things that these 12 steps provide. So how much courage do you have? You willing to go for it? There's a bunch of people around here who can show you how to do it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.